Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to our conference today. And I'm very impressed you're all very punctual and on time. Thank you very much. Uh, we will start today with our first session, which is chaired by Andrew Heuser, uh, the Executive Director of Markets at the Bank of England. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, as, uh, as you say, this panel is on non-banks and the lender of last resort. And uh, as a veteran of the LDI crisis last year, it has a particular uh, resonance for me. We've got two great papers this morning. Uh, the first one uh, is from Quentin uh, van der Meer uh, from the University of Chicago Booth, uh, who's going to be talking about the central bank's balance sheet uh, and treasury market disruption. Before the uh, event, uh, I, was, I was asking Quentin if he'd been up all night adding uh, a cyber attack scenario uh, to his paper, but like a good academic, he said, what cyber attack? So uh, I'm glad to see he's focused on the, on the paper and not that. But Quentin, if you'd like to come up 25 minutes uh, on your paper. Thanks. All right. So thanks a lot for having me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be part of this amazing conference, an amazing program. So indeed, I'm going to present this paper called Central Bank Balance Sheet and Treasury Market Disruption. This is joint work with Adrian Daverna at Stockholm School of Economics and Damon Peterson, who is a PhD student at MIT now. Okay, so the great thing about doing this conference on, on day two is that I don't, probably don't need mo much motivation at this stage. So basically, Wang Xin did all of the job for me uh, yesterday. So I'm still going to go through this slide, but quickly. So we've seen a lot of drastic evolution in treasury and repo markets recently. We had a lot of um, market disruptions. So Wang Xin mentioned the quarter end disruptions between 2014 and 2020. We also talked a lot about the, the spike in September 2019. We've seen uh, the treasury market um, being disrupted in March 2020, and then uh, in the UK, as has uh, as been just said, uh, now in 2022. Um, at the same time, I don't know what's going on with the slides, I still remember what's in it. So at the same time, we had uh, non-banks getting more and more involved into um, treasury markets. In particular, this has been the case when the, the, the um, treasury cash future basis started opening. At that time, we saw a lot of hedge funds getting in and trying to arbitrage the spread. And a little bit later, we also seen central banks getting more and more active uh, in, treasury, in, sorry, in treasury markets uh, and repo markets by acting as lender of last resort and sometimes buyer of last resort. So that's kind of like the general background for the paper. So of course, these are topics that have been um, studied before. So what is the thing that this particular paper wants to do? Well, we want to provide a theory that can jointly explain all those facts together. So it's a little bit ambitious. Another way of putting that together is basically saying we want to find like a minimal set of assumptions that can actually jointly explain those facts. Um, and so how are we going to do that? We are going to build a model, an asset pricing model, with um, basically four frictions. Um, and I'm going to mention these four frictions in the next slides, which hopefully is going to be there at some point. Um, but uh, at this stage, I want to mention that the way we are going to validate the model is by looking at different types of shocks. So when she mentioned the quarter end shocks, for instance, these are typically uh, types of shocks that happens when you have a foreign um, European, I guess foreign from a US perspective, intermediaries contracting the balance sheets because of uh, regulatory arbitrage or more like uh, a window dressing reasons. Um, okay, slides is there now, so I'm on the, ah, <laughs> that was short. Okay, so, okay, is there? Okay, so I mean basically the, the second bullet points, I'm talking about the intermediation shocks. So these intermediation shocks are these quarter end shocks where uh, the balance sheet of foreign dealers basically contracting so that US dealers have to absorb some of the slack and because the balance sheet is costly, that creates some disruption in the market. There's a second type of shock that we want to look at, which is the net uh, repo supply shock, which is typically the type of shock that will happen around uh, tax deadlines. As you remember, um, uh, 2019 was actually around the tax deadline. Uh, the third type of shock is going to be some net treasury supply shock that will happen when you have treasury issuance but also when the central bank does QT or, or even when central, central banks are doing some FX rebalancing. Um, so let me preview the results already. Uh, the first result is that central bank balance sheet is really going to be the key state variable of this model. And both sides of the balance sheet are going to matter for independent reasons. So on the asset side, it's going to matter because it's going to alleviate the balance sheet cost constraints. The, the central bank is going to absorb some of the treasuries, 
whereas on the liability side, it's going to matter because it will alleviate the reserve or intraday liquidity requirements that some of these banks may have. The second result is that there will, there's going to be a policy trade-off between the shock frequency and the intensity. When you are going to make, if you have a policy tool that makes the shock uh, less frequent, you're also going to increase the intensity of the shock. And the reason is that agents are going to anticipate that the shocks are less frequent and are going to leverage more. Um, the shock duration is going to be very important in determining if it's the treasury market or the repo market that gets most affected. And that's really related to the fact that there's going to be a tre um, some transaction costs on trading treasuries. And then uh, the last result is that um, the, the, if you want to have a repo facility, its efficiency is going to depend on the interaction between the design you have and the, top of the type of shock that you're facing. And I'll be more precise. Okay, so it's a short presentation, so I won't have time to go through all of the model. So instead, I want to show you the balance sheets. Um, so this is what the model looks like. So we have central banks, we have treasuries, yeah, it's working. Uh, we have traditional banks, shadow banks, households, dealers, and also foreign dealers. So like many agents in the model. And there are really like these four frictions that I mentioned before. First, I'm going to assume that repo and deposits are imperfect substitute for households. I'm going to capture that some, with some preferences. But you can think about it as being basically anything that makes them different. Um, then we are going to have this intraday liquidity requirement, which we are taking from an earlier paper. So, so this is basically a constraint that, that uh, is going to determine how much repo the banks can do for a certain quantity of reserves. Then we are going to have a balance sheet cost uh, coming motivated by some form of leverage ratio, creating some debt overhang type of problem as uh, Anderson, Duffy, and Song have shown in their G uh, journal finance paper. And then we are going to have that uh, trading treasuries until some tr transaction cost. And we are going to incorporate all of these shocks that I mentioned. OK, so that's for the full framework. In order to get some intuition about the paper, at first I'm going to show a simplified framework. The simplified framework is much easier and much simpler. We only have traditional banks, shadow banks, and households. And I'm going to replace the balance sheet cost friction with another friction that's even starker which is that traditional banks cannot borrow in repo. And at the same time, I'm also going to remove the multiple shocks and focus on one single shock, which is going to be a preference shock. So households will suddenly want to hold uh, more deposits and less repo. So let me go through that model quickly in just one slide. So we have our three agents. They maximize their lifetime utility from consumption. Uh, the treasury bonds, they incur a transaction cost uh, new. Households, they get this utility from holding money in the two forms, in the form of repo, in the form of deposits. They think about it as being intermediated by a money market fund. So they don't hold, uh, in reality, they don't hold repo, but they hold repo through a money market fund. And this is going to be the only shock. So this preference parameter uh, in this Cobb Douglas aggregator. So they want a mix of the two, a convex mix of the two. And the parameter in this Cobb Douglas aggregator is going to be shocked. Basically, it's going to move from a lower level in the steady state to a higher level that is uniformly distributed with uh, intensity or probability uh, lambda. And then once you're in this crisis shock state, there is a probability lambda prime from moving back to the steady state. Traditional bankers, they solve a portfolio problem where they can hold treasuries, they can uh, hold reserves and repo. Um, and they, they can issue deposits to households, and they are subject to this li intraday liquidity stress test that tells them that the quantity of repo they can do is going to be limited by the number of reserves they hold. And the idea is that there's some settlement constraints in the back here. Um, and so this is the additional assumption that I mentioned. They cannot borrow in repo, and this is going to be relaxed later, as I mentioned. We have the shadow banks as well, and the shadow banks are going to solve a portfolio problem of holding treasury bonds and borrowing in repo. And the main difference with shadow banks is that they cannot issue deposits and they cannot hold reserves. They are not banks, basically. OK, so let me start with the, the starker types of friction that I can have. I have like this perfectly inflexible benchmark where basically all the balance sheets are completely fixed. So the only thing that traditional banks can do is completely transform the reserves into deposits, whereas the shadow banks, they transform treasury bonds into repo. And that's the only thing they can do. And then we have households consuming these two uh, assets. And then what happens now if you have a preference shock to households? Well, balance sheet cannot adjust. So this means that prices need to adjust. And that's what we see over here. So in the middle panel, I have the repo spread, basically the, re the, the spread between the repo rates and the interest on reserves. And we can see it's a positive function of the level of the shock. 
And then we also have the liquidity services. We see that what's going on is that the households are going to move away from their optimal holdings of liquidity, which is an interior solution of deposits and repo. Okay, so what's going on now if I'm allowing the traditional banks to lend in repo? If the traditional banks can lend in repo, then this is not a problem anymore because if there is a preference shock, the preference shock is basically met by traditional banks getting some of the repo from the shadow banks and then transforming this repo into deposits and then the model solves. Uh, so that's what we see here. That's going to put a bond to the spread exactly where the liquidity services are optimal and the repo spread is going to be zero all the time. Okay, what's going on now? Uh, if there is an additional shock, but the banks are subject to this liquidity stress test regulation. Well, now there are constraints, so basically back into square one. So we have like this green region where the, the banks are, are extending repo elastically, so we don't see the, the, repo spread, the repo spread shooting. So banks are acting as, as lender of, of uh, last resort in this case. And then you enter, when the, the constraint is binding, you enter into the red zone. In the red zone, then the repo, rate, the repo spread starts shooting up. Here, even more, because the reserves uh, constraint is actually binding, so you have an additional wedge coming from that. Okay, then the last thing that can happen, I can also allow the traditional banks to buy some of the treasury bonds from the shadow banks. And if that happens, then even if the, the, the banks are at their constraints, we are still going to see uh, that the model solves completely because the shadow banks are basically just going to sell the treasury bonds so that the traditional banks can just extend the deposits and there is no problem anymore. But that's on only going to happen whenever uh, the, the profit of doing so is beyond the transaction cost. So that's what we see. Now we have like this additional uh, green zone that happens that also bounds the repo spreads beyond a certain threshold. And, this, and when this is going to happen, it's basically the size of this transaction cost. Okay, so that's the dynamics of the model here. So effectively, what we have is like a model that moves between a steady state, and in the steady state, it's efficient for the model to have shadow banks holding the treasuries because only shadow banks can create repo in this setting. And, and households want repo. And then the model is going to move into your shock states where uh, we see some, some the repo rates spiking up and potentially some fire sales of treasuries. So this is going to create some liquidity risk for the, for the shadow banks. And the model is going to live between these two states and the shadow banks are going to trade off the marginal benefits of arbitraging, if you want, the cash future basis. They have this comparative advantage of like creating repo with the marginal cost of uh, getting additional exposure to this liquidity risk. Okay, so let's think about this model dynamically. Um, and now let's ask the question, what's going on if we change the frequency or the probability of moving into the, sh the stock shape, uh, the, um, the um, crisis states. So in that case, the first result is some form of volatility paradox. What's going to happen is that when the probability of getting uh, into the crisis st states gets lower, then the shadow banks are actually going to take that into account and they're going to get even more treasuries into the steady state uh, regime, which means that now when you get into the crisis states, you're going to see a larger uh, expected repo spread conditional on the, sh on the shock hitting, which is what we see here, and also a larger probability of entering into this uh, fire sale of treasuries uh, zone. So you have like some form of like a, a, a volatility paradox where uh, there is um, some substitution between the intensity of the shock and, and the frequency of the shock. So if you make the shock um, um, less frequent, for instance, if you have a policy tools to do that, you're also going to make, to make the shock uh, harsher. So more market intervention in this case can create uh, some fragility. Um, okay, so let's move to the second dynamic result. Second dynamic result has to do with the probability of moving outside of the crisis states and the anticipation from the agents. Okay, so here what happens is that when the probability of moving outside the, um, the crisis states is very large, means that you're on the expectation you are going to stay in the crisis state for a very short period of time, then in that case, it's actually going to be better for the shadow banks to not to fire sell the treasuries, but rather pay a very high, potentially a very high repo rate because the, because the transaction costs a fixed cost. Whereas if you think the, the duration of the shock is going to be very long, then in that case, it's better off, they are better off just paying the fixed cost once and then being done with it. So they are trading these two things. 
And potentially, we think this can explain why we've seen in September the repo market spiking, whereas in March 2020, it was more the treasury spiking. Um, probably the, the argument here is that in, in March 2020, it was more about, a lot, there was a lot of uncertainty about the COVID shock, so we didn't know when the shock would actually end. Okay, so let's now move to the full model. So I'm going to reintroduce the treasury, the central bank, the foreign dealer, and the dealer. Um, effectively, the dealer and the foreign dealer, they are just a pass-through. They are just here to pass on the repo, just to match some institutional setting in the United States that most uh, repo transactions are actually intermediated. And here, there is going to be a balance sheet cost on the, on the domestic dealer, because the domestic dealer is going to be a subsidiary of the traditional bank. We are also going to have the treasury. Treasury is effectively issuing the treasury bonds against future tax liabilities of the household. And it's also going to have a reserves account called a treasury general account with the central bank. The central bank is going to do QE, it's going to buy the treasury bonds and hold reserves on the liability and also the reserves to the treasury general account. So we have now, I'm removing the assumption that uh, the traditional banks cannot borrow in repo, and I'm replacing that with a minor assumption serving exactly the same role, which is that traditional banks subject to this balance sheet cost, XI. Um, so the dealer, as I mentioned, they are just doing this matchbook intermediation. The fact that the dealer are doing this intermediation means now there's, there are, there's going to be two repo markets. The first repo market is going to be between the households and the dealer, or between the money market funds and the dealer. And I'm going to call it the, 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 the tri-party uh, repo market. And then there is going to be another um, uh, uh, repo market, which is going to be between the dealer and the traditional banks, sorry, and the shadow banks. And this is going to be called the bilateral repo market. And potentially, there might be a spread between these two rates. I'm going to call that spread the intermediation spread. And I'm going to introduce uh, three additional uh, shocks, not four. I didn't get the time to think about that this night. So uh, the first one is going to be uh, the foreign dealer capacity shock. The second one is going to be a shock to the treasury balance sheet, so this TGA account. And then the third one is going to be about the, the central bank balance sheet. OK, last thing I want to mention about the complete model is that now I'm also going to potentially allow for the central bank. So here is a, a representation equation for the balance sheet identity of the central bank. I'm also going to allow potentially for a repo facility and a reverse repo facility to see how that modifies the model. OK, so the first type of shock I want to look at is this intermediation shock, this quarter end shock. And so we have some regression in the, in the paper, but basically these are regressions that have been done many times, including by people in this, people in this room. Uh, so here is just a qualitative summary of what happens during these different shocks. So on quarter end, we see the repo rates, like the bilateral repo rate shooting up. We see the intermediation spread shooting up as well, and the RP volume shooting up too. So we are going to try to capture that. So um, let's see what it looks like in, in this balance sheet representation. So we have the foreign dealer that contracts on quarter end, which means that the domestic dealer has to absorb some of the slack. At some point, if the reverse repo is active, then the money market funds, or here the households, are going to prefer to lend to the central bank at the given policy rate at the RRP facility. Um, and so that's going to expand the balance sheet. That's going to um, get into the balance sheet of the central bank. And it's going to remove some of the reserves on the balance sheet of the traditional banks. And because now there is some additional space on the balance sheet of the traditional banks, traditional banks are going to be able to extend some repo. So that at the end of the day, all of the, everything clears, all the balance sheet clears in this market, uh, but prices will need to adjust uh, according to the balance sheet cost. So let's look at that uh, in terms of uh, graphs as well. So here I have a first case where there is no reverse repo facility. So if there is no reverse repo facility, the only thing that can really move is this intermediation spread. So this intermediation spread is, so the, the, the three parts of so the balance sheet cost Sorry, I should have said before. So this graph is interpreted that the shock is basically moving the balance sheet of the foreign dealer, contracting the balance sheet of the foreign dealer, meaning moving on the left in the graph. So what we see is that the balance sheet, when you move on the left to the graph, the balance sheet cost increases, which means that the three-party repo rate has to decrease in order for the intermediation spread to extend. Um, and that's really the only thing that happens here. Now I'm going to introduce the reverse repo facility. If you have the reverse repo facility, that's put a bound to how low the three-party repo rate can go. And 
So what happens here is exactly what I described with the balance sheets. Effectively, when you reach these uh, reverse repo uh, thresholds, then the traditional banks are basically going to, to get into the market and start lending repo to the shadow banks. And that's what we see here. The lending goes up. Uh, and that means that the, the spread is actually still remains constant as long as the bank can, can lend until they reach their LST constraint, their reserves constraint. At that time, the banks cannot lend anymore. And because they cannot lend anymore, then we see the bilateral repo spreads, the bilateral repo rate starts shooting up in this case. OK, let's think about what happens if we also have a repo facility. If we also have a repo facility, that puts a bond to how far the, repo, the bilateral repo rate can go. Because at some point, uh, we'll have the shadow banks getting to the, to, the, uh, to the repo facility. And so that's what's going on here. And basically, the, the central bank absorbs all of the slacks. But let's think about exactly what's going on. What's going on here is that the, the, the central bank here is really going to act as um, if you have the repo also on the left hand side as an asset, then you have the central bank as act as an intermediary. And the reason why the market can clear better is because the central bank is effectively an intermediary that doesn't have a balance sheet cost. So that's why the central bank can act. But this is not going to work if the repo facility is only available to traditional banks and not to shadow banks. So you need actually the, the repo to be available to the shadow banks as well. OK, so I can also think about what are the necessary conditions to generate this spike in this model. Well, we actually need four conditions. And if any of these four is not there, then we will never see a spike in the model. So we need a balance sheet cost. We need a liquidity stress test regulation. We need a transaction cost. And also, maybe somewhat surprisingly, we need the reverse repo facility. Because otherwise, all of the adjustments will be in the three-party repo rate. Here, you won't really only see the spikes because the three-party repo rate is bounded so that all of the adjustments need to happen on the upside instead of on the downside. Uh, OK, let's move to the, to the tax deadline on, on this uh, net supply, repo supply shock. On the tax deadline, actually, the empirical pattern is quite different. Uh, what we see is that the bilateral repo rate is increasing, but the intermediation spread is not. And we see actually a decrease in, in, in reverse repo uh, volume rather than an increase. Um, so let's try to understand what's going on here. Um, effectively, we have a tax deadline showing is going to be that the households are going to pay their taxes, so their balance sheet contracts, and the TGA account is increasing. The TGA account increasing means that it's also increasing on the central bank balance sheet, which means that now we have uh, less re uh, reserves on the traditional bank's balance sheet. And again, like the banks can actually use the space on the balance sheet in order to lend in repo. So that's what's going on here. You can look at it um, from, a, from a graph, from looking at these graphs as well in the model. Um, here, the shock is interpreted as moving to the right. So A, little a, is the, the volume at the TGA account. So what we see is that at the beginning, until you reach the LST constraint, actually, there is no movement in the spreads. And the reason is basically the, the algebra or this accounting identity here that the, the banks can basically lend. And so the spread, that maintains the spread uh, constant. Until the banks are, at some point, the banks are going to reach their uh, intraday uh, liquidity constraint. And then the bilateral repo spread is going to shoot up. Um, but here, we don't see the balance sheet cost actually does not increase. Uh, the reason is that there is actually less action for the dealers. Actually, if anything, it decreases. So let's think about introducing a repo facility uh, in this case. So the reverse repo facility is never going to be binding in this case, if you don't start from a position where it is. Um, we can introduce a repo facility. When you have a repo facility, the repo facility is going to bound, again, how far the bilateral repo spreads can go. Um, and, but there is something very different here, which is that it also works if the repo facility is only available to, treasury, uh, so to traditional banks. So you don't need to open it to shadow banks. Why is that? Well, because the constraint here is not going to be the, the, the balance sheet cost. The constraint is really going to be uniquely the liquidity stress test uh, thing. So in that case, the traditional banks are going to be able to intermediate uh, the liquidity they get from the repo to the, to the shadow banks. OK, so in the paper, we look at additional uh, shocks, but I'm, I'm running uh, out of time. So I just want to mention this additional treasury issuance shock, which is kind of like an hybrid between these two. We have that the bilateral repo rate is shooting up, and the intermediation spread is also shooting up. 
and the, the, it, it also results in increase in TGA volume in the in, in the um, in the data, and that's because at the time of treasury issuance, the the treasury gets the proceeds of the treasury issuance and put it into the TGA account, which is going to um, again like drain some of the reserves available to the banks. So we're going to see the similar types of arithmetics, but as I'm running out of time, I'm leaving that to the to the paper. Um, so. This brings me to my conclusion slide. So we have developed a general equilibrium framework to understand uh, the treasury and repo markets together. And so here I want to stress out that I think with, in, in thinking about this question, it's very important to maintain some sort of accounting identity or like general equilibrium because, and, and try to think about exactly what types of frictions that are going to prevent the market from allocating um, the, the liquidity in the place where it is needed. And so that's what we try to do in this paper. Um, and we find that we can build a, a, a reasonably simple model that can rationalize all of the recent market disruptions, or at least many of them. Um, we stress that the, the, the facility access design is going to matter for some shocks, but not others. So that's something that's worth thinking about. And we also have like, this volatility paradox, which is that if you have some uh, discretionary uh, intervention, you need to be a little bit careful because it might be that the market get accustomed to you intervening and then just leveraging more. And if at some point you have some, some, some issues intervening, you can end up with like a much larger uh, disruption than you would have otherwise. Thank you. Thank you, Quentin. Uh, let me invite uh, Loriana Pellison from uh, the Leibniz Institute for Financial Research uh, as a discussant. Loriana. Thank you. So thank you very much for inviting me to discuss this paper that, uh, as uh, you can figure out, is a complicated paper and uh, is very ambitious. So let me just you know, try to figure out, from my perspective, what are the research questions that has been addressed in this paper. So we know there is a, um, a lot of evidence that Treasury are exposed to funding shocks uh, originating in the repo market. And this paper is exactly trying to figure out how, on one side, this shock have an impact, and the characteristic of this shock have an impact on the treasury, and on the other side, how different shocks can create different type of disruption in the repo market. And uh, uh, the paper is really pointing out on what is the role of the traditional banks in and all the constraints that there are uh, for the banks to trade into the repo market, and also, what the, and this is the part I think more new, what is the role of the central bank's balance sheet in, uh, on one side, you know, uh, amplifying or in some case generating some shock in the repo market, and on the other side also on providing repo facilities and reverse repo facilities that, surprise, surprise, on one side they're creating a boundary on uh, the spike on one side and the other of the repo rates, but uh, uh, in some cases can also help to generate, in some sense, or in increase the level of the spikes. Clearly, the objective is uh, to propose a dynamic model of the treasury and repo markets. I'm adding an S because it's in the paper, you know, it's not just proposing the repo market, but it's looking also to the three-party versus the bilateral repo market. So it's a very complex thing. And uh, is uh, in, in some sense, trying to uh, have a model that is able by, you know, looking to what type of shock you have to match perfectly the empirical evidence that we observe in, uh, uh, in reality. And clearly, it's going to show on one side, as I say, the role of the central bank balance sheet, uh, on one side, the treasury, and on the other side, uh, uh, the reserves in the liability side, and the role that the different facilities, repo and reverse repo, are having in the treasury market disruption. Um, stressing treasury market disruption and, and repo because, you know, in the model there is really uh, an attempt to link the two, but, uh, but then uh, I will mention also something that there is something missed in, in the story. Is motivating the, the analysis by, you know, all the events that we know very well and is showing that indeed you can have uh, a spike in the repo rate but not all the same in terms of uh, intermediation spread in the repo market 
or reverse repo uh, volatility or something like this. So different type of shocks, even if they generate the same spike in the repo rate, uh, do have different effect in the other part of the market. This is why the model is very rich and is able to explain all these different things. As you can see, this is the model he presented very well. And uh, you know, clearly he's moving from one part to the other very, very easily, but it's, it's not a simple model. Uh, clearly it is the minimum that uh, I say he needs in order to explain all the, 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 the shocks, but clearly it is a complex uh, uh, model. And uh, he's considering different shocks. Uh, on one side, the, the fact that uh, changing preferences, and this is the key part in the theoretical model, uh, by householder between reserve and repo, a sort of demand for liquidity in the classical LM model, you know, individual do have a preference to hold cash, but if I'm giving to them a good uh, remuneration, they will move also to treasury. This is what we know from the old literature. Well, here is the same. Uh, in order to move from, uh, res from deposits to, uh, let's say, to the, the repo market, to lend in the repo market, they need to have a remuneration. This is simply what is doing. And then, you know, there are all these different shocks. So clearly, the topic, no doubt, is very interesting, and the paper also is quite new and, and interesting, very preliminary also. Uh, the first thing that I'm asking is, uh, he claimed that, uh, you know, we need all of them, all these different parts in the, in the model in order, you know, to, to justify this type of shocks that we have. Uh, but I have... I'm going back and I'm asking to all of you, why do we have a, such a complex model that can create all these type of shocks, you know? So by looking to this graph, one thing that we can think is that, well, maybe we can think to have a structure that can be simplified, I don't know, uh, household that maybe uh, lend directly to, uh, to the treasure, to, to the shadow banks or something like this, rather than going by uh, the repo or via the traditional bank uh, balance sheet. This is a general question that I think uh, it will be also interesting to, to investigate. And then uh, it is clear, maybe in the presentation it was also mentioning, but really in the paper is very difficult to understand what are these shadow banks. Are the shadow banks money market funds or the money market funds in this type of framework are in some other part? Because in his presentation, for example, he was mentioning today that they, the money market funds play a little bit the role of the dealer, but it is in the paper is very difficult. And given the role that the money market funds are having now in the market, and we know that they were playing also some role in uh, propagating the shocks in the repo market, it will be good if he's able really to characterize better in the economy of the model, what is the role of the money market funds. And then, you know, why do I, I understand that it needs that householder are investing in repo in the market, but in reality, householder are not investing in repo. They invest in money market funds, or maybe they invest in treasury. So, why householder are not investing in treasury? Why do we have all this other part that is so complicated? So just to go to the fundamentals, it will be very good. And if household include firms that are investing in money market funds, then I think it will be good if in the model you are showing to me where are the money market funds. And, uh, and you know, uh, even if they are investing directly in money market funds, you know, uh, how this is, uh, in some sense, reflected in your model, and, and in this way we can really figure out better how these shocks are, are going. For example, uh, you have also, and I know that clearly, you know, all the time you are considering the different type of uh, player in uh, based on what you need. But for example, here you get that directly house in, in another paper that you have directly householder are investing into the shadow banks thinking that the shadow banks is the money market funds. So, you know, it is easy that I'm taking out maybe one of the ingredients of your model and then that and is more close to reality and then the results are not anymore there. So, uh, you know, how much do you need all these type of assumptions and why has to be explained a little bit more, I think, in the paper. Um, that all the, the how, in the paper, at least, it is not clear who are having access to the three-party repo and who are having access to the bilateral repo. Um, 
if the household had access to the three-party repo only for lending and uh, not the shadow banks, uh, because only traditional banks can borrow into the three-party repo. Uh, this is a friction that I understand you, you are, in some sense, imposing because it's in line with the market. I'm not an expert of the repo market in the US, but you need to explain to me why you how this, who are allowed and who are not, and if you open up the three-party repo market to all the traders in the market, are we solving some of the spikes that you are observing or not? Because, you know, so far we are just looking to the case where the central bank is in, 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 in a sense helping to bound the spikes by doing all the facilities, but maybe we can also to think in order to reduce these spikes, how to change the structure of the repo market. Maybe, I don't know, if in your model, changes the structure of the repo market can solve the problem or not. And how relevant it is in your framework that, uh, you know, uh, you are really having a repo market. A repo market is characterized by the fact that if you borrow, you need to give a collateral. And in this case, the collateral is the treasury. That is exactly the two main assets that you are considering in your model, treasury and repo. But the fact that the treasury are used as collateral in the repo market is not something that you are considering in your paper. Because you know, when the treasury, there is a shock in the treasury price, this will have also an impact on the repo because the collateral, you know, the quantity of collateral that you need to provide is changing. Uh, and and again, this part that I think can be also relevant in your paper, in your model, is not considered. Maybe it is not, but then at least tell me something about uh, the role, because at the end there is no difference in your framework having a repo or having simple and uncollateralized uh, interbank market. The key thing is that you just borrow uh, without looking to the role that the collateral may have on the repo and then on the interest rate. Then, you know, uh, clearly you're looking to some shocks, but there are tons of shocks and that are also mentioned in the paper here and there. You're referring to the March 2020. But uh, the key point that I think it will be also good is that all the time that you're looking to the impact in the repo rate for the different shocks, you tell me what's happened to the treasury endogenously, and even this part is missing the paper. Because if it, this is a paper on repo and treasury, you need to do the, the last mile and tell me when a particular shock in the repo market, maybe based on the intensity, will have also an impact on the treasury price, and then a feedback effect in all the different you know, balance sheets. Otherwise, you know, you are telling me a nice story about the volatility paradox, but later on, you're not telling me anything about the treasury market, unless it's producing some shock. And, well, this part, you presented it very well, and I buy the story, you know, that clearly the intensity will have a different impact on the, uh, on the uh, price or, and, and the yield of the treasury. But, uh, uh, again, there is one part miss, that is, uh, you know, how much this is, will have an implication on uh, the collateral value. Because if the treasury yield is going up, then my capacity to borrow in the repo market will be affected. And, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the model and in reality, shadow banks cannot borrow in the three-party repo rate, repo market, how relevant is this assumption and how relevant is to have this type of structure? If we change the structure, are we solving the problem? And then, clearly, you are stressing, and the model is also be, um, set up because you want to tell us something about the role of central bank repo facilities, and I like this because, you know, this is really a new territory, and also for the central banks, this is something that uh, they are implementing it, but we are not having all the picture clear on what are then the potential uh, effect. But uh, 
you are pushing in your, let's say, model to suggest that the central bank are becoming, in some sense, the intermediary of the repo market. Because in this way, they can control this rate and impose a bound both on the shock when the repo is increasing or when it's going down. But, you know, if we have a repo market, we want that the repo market is also telling us something and, uh, you know, muting all the capacities having in providing information to the market, maybe it is not what we want. Uh, and so how can we really design uh, central bank repo facilities in a way that we still allow the market to provide the information? So can you tell us something on when the central bank should set up this type of repo facility? All the time they should be there or uh, with a very large markup or should this repo facility be activated only in extreme cases. And it is better to penalize on quantity or on price, so on the rates. Given that you have this model, maybe you can tell us something more about also how to set up, how to organize, how to uh, you know, implement these type of facilities. And then, uh, uh, as I said, you know, you are looking to all the different shocks. Some of these shocks just create a repo spike. Some other create also an impact on the treasury. Some other create an impact on both. I want to know about each of these type of shocks. When is the case that you have a spillover effect in the treasury yield? And, uh, and then, you know, also how this central bank repo facility not only mute eventually the repo uh, spikes, but also how they have an impact on the treasury yield. Because remember, this is the main part that maybe we are interested in because we want to have a safe, risk-free asset that is not too much volatile. This is our main objective at the end. So uh, if you have a model that is telling us how to organize uh, central bank uh, repo facilities to reduce spikes, tell us also how to, this will have an impact on, the, on reducing the volatility in the yield. But in any case, very interesting paper. I learn a lot. I have a lot of other questions, but I will ask to you later on. And I'm suggesting to all of you to read the paper. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Loriana. Right. I, I came prepared with some questions in case there weren't any, but I think you have about a million there, Quentin, to uh, answer. But let me, before you do, if I may, let me see if there are any questions uh, in the room or online to add to that list, because we've got a few minutes uh, for discussion. Uh, if there aren't any straight away, uh, there is one here. Um, if we could get a microphone. Um, and then, Quentin, maybe you come back on some of the discussing comments as well. But let's get, a, get some questions in the room. Yes. Thanks. Uh, this comes back to why do we have this structure, what Loriana already mentioned. It's kind of a philosophical thing, right? Rather than saying, starting with the primitives, like we used to do in corporate finance, where we say, here's limited commitment, and then we derive who writes what contracts from that. We start with kind of a demand system. Right, like we do in I.O., we just say there's, here's what person X supplies and here's what person Y supplies, and we go from there. Which is valuable, but I'm wondering if in finance we have the problem that this stuff isn't really stable. Because in, you know, if there's a big shock, if there's a crisis or something, the system might, some of the markets freeze, the system suddenly looks very different from your picture with all the balance sheets, and we're no longer sure that we can use your predictions. And I'm wondering how you think about, about that part. Thank you very much. Any, any other questions? Uh, there's one at the back here. Thank you. Um, very interesting paper, thank you. Um, if I'm not mistaken, in, uh, in September 2019, uh, the Fed also engaged in uh, the, the purchase of, uh, of T-bills. Um, and in a way, in a, this kind of uh, market functioning uh, purchases uh, that all the fee uh, refers to. And uh, I was uh, wondering if uh, there would be a role for this type of market function uh, QE or set purchases in your, in your model. And uh, if um, um, well, you, you insisted a lot on the, the importance of uh, the, the access to the central bank facilities, do you see any particular situations in which uh, market function QE would be uh, 
uh, superior to these uh, facilities, and uh, I wanted to have your, your views on, on that. Thank you. Thank you. And then I, there's a, a third question at the front here, and then Quentin will we'll come back to you. Probably only got a couple of minutes for answers just to. <laughs> no, thanks for the paper. Very interesting. No, in fact, my question is very similar to the previous one in the sense that you consider a reverse a repo facility by central banks and not as a purchases. This is very important, in my opinion, because the central bank's repo facility has two limits, I would say. The first one is uh, if dealers have a balance sheet constraint, this limits also the participation to the repo facility, and also the counterparty limits by central banks that reduce the lending to each counterparty. So why you focus on the central bank's repo facility and not on asset purchases, which is a much more important instrument? Thank you. Contentious claim there, but uh, certainly a provocative one. Uh, Quentin, let's come back to you. Yeah, so I'll do reverse order, so it's easier. So, <laughs> um, so we actually consider that, but in a different way. So the, so the way the model works, like we have the model laid down, and we put the, the, um, the facilities are part of the model, but we also consider in the paper what happens when the central bank buys the, the, the securities. And when, when that's the case, that's going to reduce the balance sheet costs. That's effectively the way the way it works. We also create some more reserves. So that's what I said at the very beginning. Didn't have much time to show that, but like the, 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 the key state variable of the, of the model is really the size of the balance sheet, and, like, and both sides are useful in this case. So this, this would help as well in the, in the model. Um, OK, the, on, the question, on, the, on your question about uh, the stability of the model. So I think we are somewhere in, the, in between, in the sense that we are taking institutional settings as given. That's kind of like the epistemology of the paper. We're like trying to take, we are taking the, the, the institutional details as given, and then we try to understand what's going on in that, that world, taking that as given. But we also consider anticipation. So the whole model is it's like fully dynamics in a sense, in that sense, like proof to look as critique. Um, so I think it's actually reasonably, it's reasonably stable to the extent that we are remaining within these institutional settings, which can, of course, change, which is going to be different in different jurisdictions and things like that. But, uh, OK, so maybe it's a good time for me to answer some points to Lorianna's uh, discussion. So thanks a lot. That was very helpful. Uh, I'm looking forward to chat more. Um, so the, f the first question you were asking, yeah, you're, you're right. It's kind of like um, um, almost a philosophical question. How do we end up in the system as we have it now? I don't think that's the question that this paper is trying to answer, except for maybe one element, which is that, which is about these um, um, intermittent disruptions. That's kind of from the genus in the model here. It's like it's really generated by the balance sheet cost. So the balance sheet cost gives a comparative advantage to the shadow banks in holding treasuries in steady states, and they are willing to do that despite taking some liquidity risk. But it's like that's because of regulatory arbitrage. So that would be that would be there. Um, so what are the shadow banks? And you're right, there's like a lack of consistency across my two papers, so I should apologize for that. But in, in this paper, it's very clear, like the shadow banks are going to be um, institutions like hedge funds or like uh, securities dealers or foreign investors that are effectively holding treasuries financed in the repo market. So they are not money market funds. The money market funds are here effectively within the, the household sector. So I was just thinking about the, the money market fund as being a pass-through. That's why we don't have them in the model. They're just like from repo to money market funds to the dealers. And so we just forget about the money market funds. Um, so OK, so that I, that I addressed. So on, on the um, using, OK, taking seriously the, the fact that the repo market is collateralized, there might be effects on the haircuts, some amplification. The, that, that the treasuries are going to reprice, that's going to matter. Of, all of these things are going to matter empirically, but as you mentioned, the model is already quite complicated. So that's the reason why. We initially, we had all these things in the model, and we just decided to take it out because it makes the model too complicated. Um, maybe you can have it in an appendix or something. Just to, there was, this would, all of these things would just create some amplification of the dynamics we have already here. Uh, and then probably just one last thing, if I remember correctly. Um, oh yes, you ask, should we um, have the, the repo facility at all times or not? And that's not really in the paper. The, the, only, the only thing that's in the paper is like, there's a little bit of a caution against discretionary intervention. And that's coming from this volatility paradox. Something I mentioned already is that 
um, if you, if you want to intervene, if you think you can intervene 99% of the time, then the 1% of the time where you don't intervene, things are going to get very bad. That's what the paper is saying. So in that sense, it would be justification for actually doing something like a repo facility, <coughs> which is like an automatic intervention. You're, you're sure you're intervening 100% of the time. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe there's something else that the institutional details has not really predicted. All right. Well, thank you, Quentin. Thanks very much. Excellent discussion. Uh, let me now introduce Jeremy Stein uh, from Harvard, well known to many of you, who's going to be talking uh, on a slightly different theme, uh, central banks as uh, dollar lenders uh, of last resort. Jeremy. OK, thanks. Let's see if um, the thing comes up. Ah, OK. So uh, this is a joint paper with, uh, with Gita Gopinath, uh, two of her colleagues at the IMF, Mitali Das and Taehoon Kim, and one of our graduate students, Helene Hall. Um, and so this paper takes up, um, Gita and I had done some earlier work trying to think about the role of the dollar and why the dollar is sort of a dominant, uh, a dominant global currency. Um, and that has many facets. Uh, so the dollar is very important in trade invoicing. It's very important in international banking. Many, many companies outside the US borrow in dollars. And then finally, central banks outside the US hold large uh, volumes of dollars. So this paper is going to be not so much about the trade invoicing, but about the other, the other aspects of, of this phenomenon. So just to give you a sense of magnitudes, um, yeah, here we go. Uh, as, of, as of this year, um, non-US central banks hold something close to $7 trillion uh, of reserves. About $4 trillion of that is treasuries. The rest of that, think of that as being like agencies and, 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 and things like that. Roughly 60% of all foreign currency reserves are, are, are in dollars. Also, uh, if you'll recall the treasury market disruption in March of 2020, um, foreign central banks were big sellers. So this is by way of saying, you know, these, these foreign central banks are probably big players, both in terms of the level of the rate as well as uh, some of the volatility um, that we see in markets. And so, you know, one question is, why do they hold so much? There are a variety of motives. Uh, we're going to focus on one particular motive, but I don't mean to, to sort of, you know, uh, downplay the others. But the one we're going to focus on is the idea that many non-financial firms, in, especially in emerging markets, tend to borrow in dollars. Uh, they do that, I guess, because it seems cheaper to them at the time. But when the dollar appreciates, that can cause trouble. And one reason for the central bank to hold dollars is if we get into a bad state of the world and they have to bail out either the non-financial firms or the, or the banks, they'll be better positioned to do that if they're, if they're holding dollars. Um, so the paper basically has two parts. One part is essentially a bit of positive economics, is thinking about what are the motives of an individual think of it as an emerging market central bank. What are their motives and why do they kind of hold what they hold? And then this, the second part is more normative in nature. It's, it's making the observation that if you let each individual central bank do what they think is optimal in terms of uh, accumulating reserves, you get an externality because no individual central bank internalizes the fact that when they hold reserves, doing that tends to push down dollar interest rates that tends to make it more attractive for non-financial firms in other countries to borrow in dollars. And in some sense, you're chasing your tail, right? Central Bank A is holding this because their, their companies are borrowing in dollars. But in doing so, they're making the problem worse for Central Bank B because they're sort of exacerbating the mismatch. So I want to sort of talk about um, that externality, OK? So just to rehearse the argument, because uh, we'll see how we do with the, with the actual model. Um, there's going to be a model of an individual small country central bank. There's some risk of a banking crisis. And the central bank is going to bail out the banking system if that happens. That crisis is going to be more problematic to the extent that some of the firms or the banks essentially have dollar denominated borrowing. Okay? Dollar reserves are, are a nice thing to have from a risk management perspective because your profits on your reserves will occur in exactly those states of the world where the bailout is most, most expensive. That is to say, when the dollar is appreciated. So as a risk management thing, it's attractive for you to hold reserves. It lowers your, your having to instead do the bailout by having expensive ex post taxation. OK, so it's attractive to hold reserves. Now, there are other things you can do as well. You can be more cautious in terms of like bank capital requirements. 
Okay, and an individual central bank is going to strike some balance uh, in, in doing that, right? They'll, they'll rely to some extent on capital requirements, some extent on reserves. What they don't internalize is that um, when they, again, when they accumulate reserves, that's going to tend to push down dollar interest rates and induce more mismatch in, 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 in other countries. Okay, so if you were imagine a global planner, the glo if, rather than an individual central bank sort of setting this all up, the global planner would say, let's do more financial regulation and let's do less reserve holding, okay? Because of this externality through the interest rate. But I think an important observation I wanna make is this is a second best argument in the sense that the only reason you care about the interest rate is because you can't control the dollar mismatch directly. Okay, I'm gonna allow basically regulators to set bank capital requirements, but what's probably less realistic is the idea that they can go into these, that they can go to their non-financial firms and tell them in which currency to borrow. If they could, if they could, this is sort of a hypothetical, if they could, you control the mismatch directly, there would be no need to use interest rates basically to do this. So this is a familiar argument in other settings where you, know, you can use this in a monetary policy context. If you have perfect financial regulation, you don't need to worry about monetary policy affecting financial stability. If financial regulation is imperfect, then the interest rate has a financial stability aspect. Okay, so this is, this is something that's in that uh, genre. All right. Um, there are some empirics in this, in this paper. They're pretty sketchy, um, and it's a theory paper, so I'm just gonna like, tell you sort of a, a thing. And it, it's, it's sketchy, so I'm not, I don't, I don't wanna claim too much. But if you plot, this is just to show you that it appears that, at least in some cases, mismatch is one of the motives, just one, but one of the motives why central banks hold dollar reserves. So this is showing you on the uh, horizontal axis the dollar-denominated liabilities of the non-financial corporate sector scaled to GDP and dollar reserves, again, scaled to GDP on the vertical axis. So there seems to be some correlation. Countries where the non-financial firms do more dollar borrowing are also countries where the central bank holds more in the way of um, dollar reserves. If you cut into this, um, you can't see this, um, it's, it's pretty robust among emerging markets, and you know, you'd know you have to squint to think that there's something uh, much, much more than that in, in advanced economies. Okay, so again, the picture I wanna leave you, I think this is a thing, or at least it's, it's a thing relative to sort of the other variables that people look in this literature. There's something about this in, in, in EM, and I wouldn't wanna claim much more. All right, so let's see if I can do a, a, a quick run through of the model. So, so pretty simple model, there's two dates. There's households. Households can save in one of three assets, in equity, which is risky, or in safe local currency deposits, or in safe dollar denominated deposits, okay? And I've just made some assumptions here, uh, pretty brute force, there's a, there's a preference, just a money in the utility function kind of thing, there's a preference for um, uh, local currency deposits, and there's an even greater preference for dollar deposits, and so their interest rates are going to be, you know, there's going to be a higher rate of return. Q here is one over one plus the, the interest rate. So there's a higher rate of return on equity. There's the next uh, is, um, is local currency deposits. The lowest rate, whoops. I did this at the IMF once. I fell off the stage altogether. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, this feels a little too familiar. So anyway, the, the first two of these guys are exogenous, and then the dollar interest rate will depend on the supply and demand of dollar claims. Okay, so that's the only, that's the only endogenous rate here. There's an exchange rate. It's exogenous. It can be higher or, higher or lower. Um, there's what I'm gonna call banks, but what you should think of as basically I've smooshed together the banks and the, and the non-financial corporate sector here, okay? So the bank is raising money for projects and it can finance itself with one of three things. It can finance itself by issuing deposits in either currency or by issuing equity. And this is just, uh, anyway, that thing in the middle there is just its balance sheet constraint. Okay, and then there's gonna be some probability of a banking crisis, and if there is a banking crisis, some of the banks are gonna be basically just 
disappear, their revenues are going to go to zero, and then the government is going to step in and bail out the depositors of those banks. Okay? And just for the moment, and just, just to make things a little simple, assume that the, the banking crisis occurs independently of the realization of the exchange rate. More realistically, it's going to tend to occur when the local currency is depreciated, and I can put that in, uh, in, in a minute. So first of all, what are the banks? Um, so if you just leave the banks to themselves, again, this is the banks plus the non-financial corporates, what are they going to do in terms of dollar borrowing? It's going to be a very simple trade-off between, on the one hand, dollar borrowing is cheaper, and S here is the spread. That's basically how much cheaper dollar borrowing is. And they're going to trade that off against the fact that even if they're not bust, if the dollar appreciates and you're basically borrowing in dollars, that's going to make you more liquidity constraint. So I've got this liquidity constraint parameter gamma. I don't know why this doesn't. Oh, there we go. So the banks are basically going to borrow more in dollars if the spread is bigger and less in dollars if, if it causes a liquidity constraint mismatch uh, problem. Okay, What is the central bank going to do? Well, the central bank can hold dollars, but there is a carry cost to them of doing that, because if they hold the dollars, those are lower yielding than other stuff they might hold. For example, just you know, uh, general assets of other sorts. Okay, so on the one hand, they're going to not want to hold it. On the other hand, um, there's going to be some some ability to to hedge against the fact that if they don't have reserves and they have to do a bailout, they're going to have to raise taxes. And I'm going to assume there's some deadweight convex deadweight cost of taxation. Okay, so um, you get a very simple trade-off here. It's it's you know. It's kind of what you'd expect. If there is no carry cost, I don't know why I can't make this thing show up on here. Anyway, at the top line, if there's no carry cost, if the SK is zero, they'll basically hold enough reserves to cover the bailout entirely. Okay? On the other hand, as the carry cost goes up, they're going to do less with reserves and more with ex post taxation. Okay? Okay, it's a very, very sort of simple trade off for the, for the central bank. The one thing I want to emphasize here. People often say, well, can't you do the same thing with central bank swap lines as reserves? No, they're very different, at least in this model. What the reserves are doing are they're, they're playing a risk management role. That is to say, when you hold dollar reserves, you're transferring wealth to states where the dollar has appreciated. Right? You have this, this pile of dollar reserves that will be worth more if the dollar appreciates. That's exactly the state of the world where your bailout is going to be more expensive because you've got to bail out these dollar-denominated liabilities. It's very analogous to corporate risk management. You've basically got costly external financing. Here it's taxation. So you want to move wealth to states of the world where it's most needed. Okay? Swap lines don't allow you to do that. Swap lines are basically state by state. You can borrow against the wealth you have in that state, but they're not allowing you to move money from one state to the other. Okay? So not to say, of course, that swap lines aren't valuable, but they're just a different tool. They're a liquidity tool. This is, in some sense, an insurance tool where you're moving, you're moving wealth across states of the world. Okay? And then finally, you, have to th you, you can think about capital requirements to do that. You've got to write down the planner's problem. Okay? I'll, spare you, I'll spare you the details, but this is sort of what the, what the planner cares about. Um, and you know, what they're sort of thinking here is, on the one hand, capital requirement is costly because the banks like, and you know, the households ultimately own the banks, they like borrowing in dollars, or they like borrowing just cheaper than equity. And, that's, and it creates value, basically, for the households, because the households get utility for money. So you don't want to do too much of that. That's the capital requirement. On the other hand, if you don't have much of a capital requirement, you're going to be stuck with more in the way of kind of crisis costs, which you're going to have to manage either with reserves or with taxation. OK, so there's going to be an interior optimum here. And not surprisingly, it's going to depend. Oh, I, one thing I should say is a capital requirement just tells you how much equity the banks have to have. It doesn't tell you the mix of dollar funding versus local currency funding. Right? So it can only pin down the sum of those two. The banks will then choose their optimum, which is as before. Okay? So in effect, all you're doing with the capital requirement is controlling local currency borrowing uh, deposits. Right? You, can't control them. you can't control the sum. Okay? And so you'll do that. Basically, you'll do less capital requirement when there's a lot of value created by local currency deposits. Okay? Um, 
as a hypothetical, you can also ask what would happen if we, if we allowed the, the central bank to directly control uh, both capital or, you know, essentially control the entire capital structure, okay? And they would like to do that, okay? Because they really don't like mismatch. Um, let me, I'm not gonna show you all the, all the math. Let me just give you a little example here. So in a world, in the, the first column, when there's no regulation, okay, no capital regulation, the banks won't hold equity capital voluntarily, okay? They tend, in this example, to do a lot of the borrowing in dollars. That's the 67. And as a result, the central bank feels like it needs to hold a lot of reserves. If you let them only do capital requirements, they'll push the capital requirement roughly up to 10% in this example. What they'd like to do but I'm not really gonna kind of allow them to do, is if you let them do both capital and funding, they'd say, not only do I want capital, but I wanna change the funding mix. I want my guys to be borrowing much less in dollars and much more in local currency because of this mismatch problem. Okay, so that's the last, that's the last um, row over here. That's the, the dollar borrowing goes down from 67 to 14. Okay, now that's the thing to keep in mind when we go to the global thing is that, the, if I shut down, if I have imperfect regulation where I only allow them to do capital, but I don't allow them to directly control funding, their second best way of doing that is gonna be by caring about interest rates, okay? And that's where the externality is gonna come in. All right, so um, the global economy is gonna be basically um, the same as before. There's just gonna be lots and lots of these countries. There's gonna also be the US, which I'm gonna to have to kind of keep track of because the dollar interest rate, if I wanna do the welfare right, I've gotta take account of the fact that it, like, it affects US taxpayers. So the US is just very, very small role. It's just basically borrowing in the bond market and it benefits, so US benefits from lower, lower interest rates. All right. Yeah, um, uh, don't look at all of this stuff other than to say, I, I'm assuming that there's a downward sloping demand for dollar assets. So the more dollar assets there are, the, uh, the lower will be the interest rate, okay? And reserves, basically, if central banks hoard a lot of reserves, there's fewer dollar assets available for everybody else, so that'll tend to drive down interest rates, okay? Um, and so the only thing that's sort of different between the global planner and the local planner is they understand that these reserve accumulation decisions affect interest rates. All right. Um, okay, so here's the only thing to look at and just only to look at a little piece, which is this whole planner thing is a god awful mess. If you do everything and you sort of net out all the transfer terms, you can write it like this. You, this is saying, what is the, how, is, how does the planner's welfare depend on dollar reserves, right? So this is what's the planner's interest gonna be in essentially moving around dollar reserves. It has two pieces. Sooner or later, I'm gonna either fall off the stage or I'm gonna get this thing right. Okay, so part of it is they're just aligned with the local planner. And then there is a wedge between the two of them. And the only important thing to look at is this thing phi which says there is only a difference, there's only an externality, there's only a difference between the global planner's perspective and the local planner's perspective to the extent that this phi thing is non-zero. What is phi? It's D dollar borrowing, D reserves. So it's only if the, reserves, the, the reserve holding decisions influence mismatch by the corporate sector. Okay, that in turn is only non-zero if reserve holding decisions affect interest rates. So, okay, so in this imperfect regulation setting, the only reason there's a divergence between the global planner and the local planner is the global planner thinks, ah, if I, so let's say, get them to hold less in the way of reserves, that's gonna affect the interest rate and that in turn is gonna lower mismatch, okay? That's the only, otherwise we're, we're, we're perfectly aligned. Okay, so um, doing that, I'm gonna skip this one. Here's one way of thinking, we have a result. It's not, it's not the case that it's always true that the global planner is gonna want lower reserves, but there's a very intuitive uh, sort of uh, uh, a scenario where, where they do, which is if, the, if 
there is mismatch in the following sense. If I hypothetically allowed you to control dollar borrowing directly, if I said, here, I'm going to give you an extra, let's pretend I give you an extra tool, and I let you control dollar borrowing directly. If you did, would you lower it below the, the free market choice? Okay. The answer to that is yes. I'm going to say there's the, the, the market basically generates socially excessive mismatch. Okay? If the market generates socially excessive mismatch in that sense, then you'll always want to control reserves. Why? Because that's the only way of getting mismatch down. Okay? So I'm sort of taking, what we're doing is taking as given that basically the private sector, the incentives of these private sector firms, is to do too much dollar borrowing. Why? Because they don't internalize you know, what this does in a crisis state of the world. So if I say to you, boy, wouldn't you really like to control that directly, as in my previous numerical example, but I take that away from you, well, what else can you do is try to operate on interest rates. Right? It's the same thing, again, as in many other contexts. If I say, wouldn't you like to have really good financial regulation so we have no financial stability problems? Well, if I take that away from you, make it imperfect, maybe you have to bring interest rates into the game. Okay, same story, same story here. So that's, that's what we've got here. A sort of a, almost another way of saying the same thing is if I do give you perfect regulatory power and I could allow you to basically not only regulate banks but regulate all the non-financial firms in the economy and just tell them, guys, no mismatch, then there's no more externality through the interest rate, right? Because the only thing was, because you're doing it as a sort of second best way of controlling mismatch, but if you can control it directly, you're done. Okay, so that's um, that's the story. Uh, that's the story there. Uh, let's see how am I doing? Um, yeah, so I have some another new couple of numerical examples. Um, I'll skip these and just say a few words um, about a, a, a possible extension, which is um, so far to just focus on this externality. I didn't say this, but what I had been assuming when I did the global case is that everybody's banking crisis happens at the same time. Okay, I did that because I was setting aside what's another natural motive for economizing on reserves is just risk sharing. Right? I, I mean, this is why you know this is why people have credit lines from banks. Right? Each firm could accumulate enough liquidity to kind of get through a bad state of the world, but boy, they'd be holding a lot of liquidity. If their if their needs for liquidity aren't perfectly correlated, better to have it sit in a bank and the bank give out credit lines. Right? There's an identical logic here. If the financial uh, if the crises hit um, if the crises hit different economies in a non-perfectly correlated way another motive for essentially economizing on reserves is if you have some way of redistributing, right? Of, you know, basically, you know, if, if take the extreme case where the, the things are perfectly negatively correlated, we don't both need to be holding enough to get us through. Only one of us does, and we've got to just somehow have a, a, a mechanism for, for reallocating. Um, it's interesting, you would think you would think that this is sort of a natural role for the IMF, right? For the IMF to be the bank, in my example, you know, and, and the countries to be like the, the firms. The IMF does have um, these credit line facilities that look a lot like what we have in mind. It, you know, it's basically a form of insurance um, across states, okay? They have, I mean, there's, there's a couple of these things. One's called the flexible credit line. The other's called the precautionary and liquidity line. As they're currently set up, they have relatively strict eligibility requirements, so there's actually very few countries that, that use or have, have used them. But the model at least suggests that something like this might have this other virtue of essentially helping with this, with this externality through the interest rate. It's interesting because the IMF's head, uh, Kristalina Georgieva, just recently gave a speech or, or had a paper which wasn't this, this, this as specific, obviously, as, as our model, but was saying, you know, there's a lot of self-insurance with, with countries holding reserves, but geez, you know, it might be a good thing to strengthen the role of the IMF um, in, providing, in providing this insurance. So you can think about this, this model as at least sort of trying to relate to, to, that, uh, to that way of thinking. Okay, so I think I, done. Okay, thanks, yeah. thanks very much.
Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, and now I'd like to welcome uh, Yevgenia Passari from the University of Paris Dauphin uh, as a discussant. So hello, everyone. A big thank you to, to the organizers for including me in the program. Uh, I'm very excited to be here and to discuss this paper. And I certainly learned a lot in the process. Um, so I'm going to start again in a similar way with, with uh, the starting point of the paper, the main idea is that central banks uh, tend to hold uh, large volumes of dollar-denominated reserves. And they do that for a number of reasons, right? So, so I don't want to, to repeat uh, the presenter. Uh, there, there is obviously uh, the role, big role of invoicing. And, and some of the authors have earlier contributions. So a lot of the countries are trading directly with the United States. It's a good thing to hold dollars. And then there is this idea of risk sharing, right? Because uh, the US is an extremely developed country financially. So effectively, there's a counter cyclical safety premium into holding dollars. And uh, there is a natural incentive for central banks to, to hold dollars as they want to intervene in the FX market to control the level and the volatility of exchange rates. And then there is a lot of papers now talking about the, the role of the dollar as a global reserve and global anchor. So there is an appeal, again, of, of holding these currencies. And, and I'm going to, to basically focus on not just me. Like the paper is about, has this view of the world, that central banks, uh, they have a precautionary motive of stockpiling dollar reserves because effectively they are concerned about a potential bailout, uh, essentially, event. Right? So, so the way this works, Right, there's a currency mismatch. That, that's a fact that, uh, among others, uh, is, is Wang Xi that has documented that for the emerging market space, uh, along with co-authors. So there is a currency mismatch in the private sector liability composition. So then again, effectively, it makes sense for, for the central bank to, to have the dollars in, for an event of a potential bailout. Now, there are two main questions that this paper is asking. So the first one, uh, the authors are thinking about the potential implications because as a result of this, you know, stockpiling that, that happens across economies globally. And the second one, whether the, the, there should be a friction when it comes to the incentives of individual central banks as, as they're thinking about, as they're planning their policies, and, and that with a global planner. Uh, that, that for the paper is going to be the US, right? So, so basically that is going to see uh, certain effects on, on the dollar and on the interest rate as a result. So the paper starts uh, with, with an empirical exercise that, that gets again motivated by, by the findings of, of Wang Xi and Jesse. So, so what, what Wang Xi finds in this paper is that firms like corporate firms, more importantly different uh, than the government, uh, keep effectively running these currency mismatches in their capital structures. So, so this paper is about emerging market firms, and there's a correlation between this finding and sovereign defaults. So starting from that, the authors try to basically draw this meaningful correlation between the central bank's reserves in US dollars and given that we cannot directly measure this mismatch, that's extremely hard to get in terms of data, and these are confidential data, there is a proxy that has to do with cross-border dollar-denominated bank borrowing of the corporate sector. So there, there's a crucial hypothesis that, that goes when, when they're assessing this correlation, and that is that Effectively, this dollar-denominated bank borrowing approximates well the corporate sector's currency mismatch. I'm going to come back to this point in a second. And then the logic is that effectively, when you have mismatch firms, when it comes to their balance sheet, then you have a higher probability of a banking crisis. And that is going to fuel the motive of the central bank to act as a dollar lender of last resort and hence accumulate reserves. So I'm going to, to very quickly go through the model. Um, so it's a two-period model of optimal reserve accumulation for a small open economy central bank that basically is trying to mitigate this, this bailout risk. So, so this model borrows a lot of elements from some of the author's earlier work. And you have utility maximizing households 
uh, that, that save in home currency denominated safe assets, then safe assets denominated in dollars, and also some home currency equity, and then consume in home goods. So, so you have then the banks that really are not the banks conceptually, but this is, these are the firms, right? This is the non-financial firms that seek to minimize the sum of the expected funding and the mismatch costs. And then you have the central bank, right, who tries to avoid a bailout event. And, and in that effort, they, they have three tools, right? So they can stockpile dollars in terms of reserves, so they can just step in and, and act and bail out uh, in a better way. And, and then effectively they can set, effectively they can request uh, from the banks or from the first if you want, to be better capitalized, all right? And the third one is to directly, uh, effectively intervene on the mix, on the deposit mix of the banking sector, which is not very credible because there's not an easy way to do that, right? So, so that was already explained. So th there are two natural trade-offs arising from, from these incentives. So on one hand, when you stockpile dollars, what, what you have is reserve carrying costs and deadweight uh, cost of taxation. But on the other hand, if you impose higher capital requirements, what happens is that you're harming profits, right? So the more you retain, the less you can invest, you're harming profits, you're harming social welfare. So what is going to happen in the model where we're going to have two outcomes depending on basically whether the equilibrium is going to be locally chosen or we're going to have an equilibrium with a central planner. So if it's locally chosen, then the central banks are going to choose a mix that is going to allow for a higher stockpiling in dollars and lower requirements because effectively they don't want to harm welfare. But what they, they don't internalize in this process, that when they collectively engage in this behavior, what effectively they do is that they're compressing down the, the dollar interest rate. And, and that's an issue because then what happens is that their firms are going to engage, they're going to binge into more dollar borrowing, and that is going to exacerbate the problem, right, the, the, the risk of the bailout. So when a global, a global planner is allowed to take this decision, they're of course going to think about that. So they're going to choose a mix that, that is going to have lower dollar reserves and higher capital requirements. So, so I think that's the story. There are extensions. There is a correlated risk between banking crisis and dollar, depreci sorry, dollar appreciation and so on and so forth. Now, the paper makes several contributions. So if we think about the small open economy version of the model, the authors are able to match some of the empirical findings. And then I think obviously the main contribution of this paper is theoretical and it's conceptual even, is this equilibrium when you have a global planner, right? So you have these externalities and then it's, it's very interesting to, to sort of think about this, the model's normative properties. Now, the authors contribute to the precautionary view of reserve stockpiling. So there are two literatures there that I stockpile because of trade, so it's a mercantilist view, or I stockpile because I want to basically mitigate some, some risk in the financial system, and, and this is where this paper falls. And there are very interesting normative, uh, essentially, conclusions for regulators, so it's, it's very you know, thought-provoking to think about you know, a, a centralized, institutions such as the IMF, who is going to coordinate and, and engage in this allocation of reserves every time a country has this need. Uh, so, so actually this is going to be, you can think of it as a separate mechanism over Basel, right? So you have Basel for capital requirements, and then you have this centralized institution that is going to you know, give you um, instructions about how the dollar reserves are going to be allocated. So uh, I'm gonna basically have few comments. Um, so given that I'm an empiricist by training, I'm gonna start with the data, and then I'm, I'm gonna try to, to think about the missing elements of the model. So the authors uh, have this first empirical exercise. Uh, we have already seen some of the plots. However, there is an alternative explanation to those scatter plots, especially if we focus on the developed markets panel. So central banks, can accumulate dollars as we both started the presentations. 
to stabilize their currency or to prevent it from further strengthening because of trade or different reasons, right? So keys in point, and that's gonna be a cheap shot on my part, so I apologize. I'm gonna take the Swiss experience, right? So, so it, it, it's, it's part of your developed market sample. So, so your data start in 13, but, but you do have inside this period between 11 and, and, and 15 where, where the franc is pegging to the euro. So, so the franc kept going up in value because at that point in time, it was perceived as the last remaining safe haven. Right? So, so Europe was battling with the sovereign crisis, the yen was artificially held low, and then you have the, the economic policies in the US that, that caused a lot of you know, uncertainty. So effectively, that became an issue for the Swiss companies right, who were considering even moving operation out of the country. So the incentives for the reserve accumulation in dollars were different. So, so on the left panel of this slide, I have your, your scatter plot in the advanced economies. And on the right hand side, I have a graph from Chini, Tom, and Macaulay, 2021. Uh, that is to say that throughout this period, the Swiss were not mainly stockpiling dollars, they were stockpiling euros. And, but that's a good site for your story because you see those two peaks, right, in the euro accumulation. So they actually coincide with the Greek crisis, the first one, and the second one coincides is the period be, be just before the statement by Mario Draghi of whatever it takes. So you see that in crucial points, the Swiss stockpile euros potentially to intervene with a motive that lines better with your story. Now, that does not change the fact, right, that throughout this period there is a statement by the bank that, you know, they, they want to intervene essentially, and they're prepared with utmost determination to purchase foreign exchange in unlimited quantities to bring down the franc. But what I'm thinking is that by looking at your developed markets panel, where you have a lot of countries that could care about the euro, you could basically exploit this period and show this fact, but for the euro, better for this period. Now, is that problematic for your story? No, it's not, because it does not change the fact that globally, countries are stockpiling dollar, right? But it will strengthen your motivation, especially for this panel, because its composition tends to, to show more of a motive when it comes to dollar that aligns better with invoicing stories or interventions. Now, there is a technical issue that's a bit geeky. Feel free to ignore. So when you're looking at these scatter plots, there are certain assumptions, right? Number one, uh, these are extremely hard to measure variables of interest and, and I appreciate you do your best. Number one, when you're looking at cross-border dollar bank loan data, you actually creating different distortions in the measurements, I think. So for the developed markets panel, right, you're trying to approximate always the currency mismatch. Now there's a good reason to think that developed market banks are better hedged, right? So what could be happening, it could, you could be overstating the mismatch in that panel. And then if you look at the correlation between cross-border lending and total lending, it seems that that's weaker on your emerging markets panel because you're missing the dollar banks, right? Lending reserves. And there's again this possibility that emerging market firms rely more relatively to local bank funding. So the second correlation could be slightly understated. So as you said, obviously, when you're looking at these scatters, I agree with you, the emerging market panel comprises of countries that really tend to, to borrow in dollars, right, to reserve, basically, sorry, to accumulate reserves for precautionary reasons. Now, let me go to the missing ingredients. So the model focuses on one channel, this precautionary view to, to avoid the crisis. Now, obviously there are different incentives, especially for your developed markets country, as I said before, the, 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 the traders are different. That becomes a little bit crucial for your model, I think, because the most important holders of dollar reserves are not necessarily the emerging market countries, right? They tend, like you can think about, okay, you have China there, but then again, the motive of China should be more like a trade story. You have Japan that I don't think potentially stockpiles for, for, for a bank run. So, so you have different types of countries, right? So the developed markets country panel 
includes a number of net credit donations and net exporters. Now, is this a problem for your model? Again, not necessarily for what the global plan planner is thinking, because to the extent these guys are stockpiling dollars for whatever reason, then the dollar rate is going to be lower, it's going to be compressed. And that's a problem, at least for the emerging market sample, because that brings up the possibility of a bailout, right? So, so that's fine, your story goes through. But what one would think is that you could model the individual central bank trade-off in a richer way, right? So to include a trade-off about inflation or to include a trade-off about invoicing, for instance. Now, some other minor issues, so firms' response to policies, there is a possibility of regulatory arbitrage, right? We have this example of Chinese firms. So once the government tried to, to cut credit in firms in a risky sector, what happens is those guys, like the, the shadow banking, like increased and, and they engaged in intra-firm lending. And there's there, again, I think that the last part of the paper, which is extremely interesting, you're very open about this, there, there are moral hazard consideration, political frictions, and issues of coordination. I'm not saying this paper should solve them, but, but then, again, they, they call potentially for a richer structure. So I think it's an extremely important topic. It's a rich model in, in a sense of, you know, these this externalities and, and the global planning. Like, I, I really enjoyed it. And I think it's a really significant contribution and in the way we get to think about those issues that, that are becoming very important because the model gives us a very useful toolkit to basically address those issues. Now, I don't know if you need the empirical section, but maybe you can make it work for you once you tweak it a little bit. And I think there is room for enriching the model or for a second paper and follow-up research. So, thanks. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Evgenia. Um, we've got just a couple of minutes to take any questions in the room. There are obviously some points there for Jeremy to come back on uh, as well. Does anyone uh, have any questions that they'd like to raise? There's one right over here in the far side. So it seemed in your model the demand for dollar deposits is because local depositors get sort of extra money in the utility function from dollars. I'm wondering the extent to which you think uh, dollar borrowing is so that international lenders can reach you, and if that's the case, whether you think capital controls are effective for the externality you have in mind. Thank you. Anyone else? If not, Jeremy, why don't I turn back to you? Uh, so on that, yeah, it's a good question. This model is not all that well suited in the sense that in our previous model, I think we had a better motive for, for, dollar, for people wanting to hold dollar deposits because they were hedging the fact that they had to purchase goods that were invoiced in dollars. So that gave you kind of a micro. Here it's so ad hoc that I don't really know how to quite think about this very good question. I, 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 I don't have a good answer for you, um, but it's a good question. Thank you for a terrific discussion. Um, the empirical points are all very well taken. Uh, I mean, I, I'm a little bashful about the empirical section. I thought it was useful to kind of have it as motivation, but um, you know, both because, I mean, we ran into just more data limitations than you would think you would run into in, in this thing, in spite of the fact that we tried pretty hard. And because, again, there are lots and lots of motives, and I think your Swiss example is, is a good one. Um, I, you know, I, that's part, and the Swiss, the, the, the Swiss data point actually played a pretty big role in the advanced economy result to the extent there was one. That's part of the reason I was downplaying it, uh, precisely because of your, your thing. I think there's something going on here in EM, but then you're of course right that the EM countries by themselves aren't explaining a lot of the mass of dollar, especially if you exclude China, are not exp you know, explaining a lot of the mass of dollar holding. So that's, that's all very fair. Um, you mentioned one thing about the FX mandate of central banks, and do they hold reserves for that reason? Um, one sort of limitation of the model, but I think we could sort of fix this, is we take the exchange rate as exogenous. Um, 
But of course, if it was a little bit endogenous and if the central bank could manage it, there'd be a motive that's very similar, which is you know, you, one reason you don't want the exchange rate, your local currency to depreciate against the dollar is that makes a banking crisis worse. So you'd be intervening. You'd want to hold reserves in a sense for very much the same sort of reason. And I think the overall logic would, um, would probably go through, but let me. Let me stop there, but thanks again for, for terrific. Thank you. I think we have one question here, well, maybe two at the front. Uh, since one of them comes from the organizers, he'll be well aware that we're already over time, and I'm sure it'll be a concise question. <laughs> the, wait for the microphone. <laughs> From the 80s and 90s, spearheaded by Gian Maria Milisi Ferretti, Philippe Lane, our chief economist, who spoke yesterday, um, also discussing the overall level of countries' foreign indebtedness. Mm -hmm. And this leisure to ascertain that a level uh, below 60% of GDP was considered sustainable. Mm -hmm. But in some cases, 30% was not, not sustainable in some countries. So these uh, this authors looked at the, the um, strength of the current account balance, the trade balance, and so forth. So I wonder if you can also build an anchor to this uh, old literature and, and differentiate when you have these scatter plots that are all dense, all these mm -hmm. countries, you can add uh, a few more charts along the line uh, suggested by Eugenia, but also uh, considering the overall uh, foreign indebtedness, private and public, uh, from the various countries, and you may tease out some more uh, empirical results. Okay, and then I think one question here, and then we'll we'll conclude. No, thanks for the for the paper. No, my my question regards the the um, the choice of central bank to avoid, in order to avoid increased tax in t, in t plus one plus two, they decide to accumulate reserve now. But maybe it could be some, um, this trade-off could be explained a bit better in the modern sense that uh, the cost of community reserves is not only by dollar now, but also the moral hazard and um, other aspect that maybe could be more convenient for the central banks to not accumulate reserves now and wait for T2 in case to increase tax later than stockpiling reserve now. So if it, maybe the, why you didn't elaborate on this aspect in, in the model. Great. And if I may, if you can <laughs> introduce yeah. a liquidity <laughs> regulation to address the, the regulatory weakness, which kind of regulation you want, liquidity cover ratio or mandatory aging or dollar exposure for corporates? Thank you so much. Thank you. OK, Jeremy. so uh, on moral hazard, there is moral hazard in the model in the sense that the bailout creates a form of moral hazard and it encourages people to uh, it encourages the individual um, actors to over borrow in dollars in part to the extent that the bailout comes in a dollar strong state of the world. So there is that there is not an extra moral hazard because the bailout is financed with reserves as opposed to taxation, though I guess you could. You could you could have something along those lines as well on the the ideal liquidity regulation would be to control the dollar funding mix, okay? Now what's important is that that dollar funding mix in reality, even though the model kind of blurs this, lives on the balance sheet mostly of non-financial firms. In other words, the banks themselves, in part because of bank regulation, themselves are not too outright mismatched, but they've passed that on to the non-financial firms. So what you would need is the ability to basically see through and regulate those guys. And sort of our operating assumption is that that ability is imperfect, in, in part because there's lots of ways to regulatorily arbitrage that. And given that it's imperfect, then there's, then there's this role for caring about the interest rate. On the other question about sort of these other motives for holding reserves, we haven't done a great job here. You know, we've thrown in a bunch of covariates, which are some of the other variables that people have looked at, um, you know, in, in this literature. Um, and our result is, pretty insensitive to those covariates, but I don't feel all that great about that because of all these other, <laughs> these other issues. I just think the data, at least the data that we've been able to put together is so limited, and we've you know, not even taken at all of a, a sort of crack at, at any kind of identification that I think your suggestion that we take the empirical part out, <laughs> I'm guessing an editor uh, may well say that. Uh, so, yeah, you know. Uh, 
I, I, it's more of a wish to have a little bit of evidence along these lines, but, but, but very much limited. Yeah. There could be regulation. Yeah. I mean, or I would look at the euro. Yeah. Right. Well, on that bombshell, uh, let's draw this to an end. Thank you very much. Let's show our appreciation for everyone who's there.